Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Tran Bowie. If you are watching right now, that means that you care. That means that you want to learn and grow and that you want to be a part of the solution. If you're watching right now, that means that you no, care. all lives matter. Let's protest. No, you're encouraging the looters and the criminals. I could lose clients and friends if I say something. But if I don't say something, then I sound like a racist. If I don't support the black community, then there's going to be backlash. Um, we need to support them. No, they need to fix their own problems first. It's a lot. It is really heavy. Um, so tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to listen. And we're going to do it with an open mind and especially an open heart. So please welcome my six guests right now. Um, so we have Patrick Lee, Dr. Robert James, Rick Banks, Julian Amadi, and Robert Haddix. And in just a moment, we are going to be joined by Tyler Washington as well. Gentlemen, thank you so much um, for doing this and being a part of this conversation. It is clearly needed. And I feel like right now is the time to listen. Um, so let me first start um, by going around the table and one word on how you feel about what's going on. Patrick, let's start with you. One word about how I feel going on right now. Um, I would say hopeful. Mm, okay, Dr. James. For me, I, I agree with Patrick. I'm hopeful. Okay, Rick. I'm grateful and hopeful. Agree with both those guys. <laughs> so you have two words. Yes. Yes, Julian. two words. <laughs> <laughs> Already. All right, Julian. Um, I'll say empowered. Mm. Mm -hmm. Robert? Encouraged. Encouraged. And for a moment now, uh, Rick, I'm just going to take you out. And Tyler, your word. Um, I have to say grateful as well. Grateful as well. Okay. Um, so let's start now. You know, a common question that we often hear, and it's something just so very simple, though, gentlemen. Do we say Black or African American? Dr. James? <laughs> Um, um, for me, both um, Black as well as African American. Um, African, for me, ties into my heritage and who I am. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I'm okay with either one. Okay. Julian, for you? Um, either one, again. Okay. Either one, it doesn't, yeah. Right. Does anyone have a preference? No. All right. Well, that's good to know. Sometimes, you know, as a journalist, I find that, you know, when I was writing scripts, I'm like, what, what do I say? And it depends on, you know, in certain communities, some I've had, I've had some, you know, friends tell me, oh, you need to say this and others saying you need to say that. So I, I, I like that the conversation is open. Um, let's start with you, Dr. James. What is it like being a black man in America? Oh, uh, that's, that's a, a heavy question right now. Oh, let's start um, off. <laughs> well, <laughs> right now, um, uh, like some things that we mentioned earlier, it, it is hopeful, right? Um, we see that there's some conversations that are being held that hasn't been taking place for years, right? Um, we see some um, young people um, who are joining in this conversation for the future. Um, so while we're, I'm hopeful, I'm also concerned, um, if that makes sense. Um, during this season, I'm concerned because some people can... Uh, misunderstand what's going on um, and ride this way for other other motives. Um, but for me, um, being an African-American in this season, um, it reminds me of my heritage and who I stand for. Robert, for you, um, let's talk about that. Growing up as a, you know, as a black boy and then now, like how has it been? What is it like for you? Uh, well, it's a, it's a little different for me just because where I grew up, which was New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, it was a heavy Cape Verdean population. So I know most of you, most of you out, out there don't know about Cape Verdeans, mm -hmm. but Cape Verdeans are mixed Portuguese and African ancestry. And most of your people of color in New Bedford uh, were Cape Verdeans. So uh, to, to get to a point, uh, in New Bedford growing up, I was considered very brown skin or, or dark skin because most of the people uh, like my mom were very fair skinned uh, black people. So uh, if anything, we kind of had a, uh, 
some self doubt maybe as, as kids, because you didn't want to be too black. You wanted to be light. So we had some, some, uh, you know, things that we struggled with as blacks. If, if you were browner, if, if you, if you, because just like how it is today, in many cases, lighter, sometimes it's considered better. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and as a kid, maybe you can't process all that. Mm -hmm. a, a twist for me because growing up, yes, I'm considered a brown skinned boy. And then I come down to Atlanta, and if anything, now I'm considered a light skinned man. Right. So I had a little, little twist in terms of complexion, and complexion sadly still does, you know, ha have a, a, a major role in some of our own identity crisis, crises. Right. And, you know, and Patrick, uh, your mother was white and your father is black. So for you. Uh, did you say me? Yes. OK, sorry. Went out for a second. Uh, for me, I guess, uh, you know, being a black man, I grew up in Oklahoma, uh, pretty much growing up as a kid, um, being biracial. Uh, it was definitely different. Um, because you know you 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 have to the the white people saying you're black the black people saying you're white um, so you had that dynamic you had to deal with as well but growing up in Oklahoma uh, you still had a lot of segregation you know whenever I grew up we considered that the South uh, we we thought that was the deep South until I moved over here to Georgia and Florida area then I really realized what the South really was so but at that time even growing up there's still a lot of segregation as far as you know, where you lived uh, in town. You know, we lived on top of the hill on the other side of the, the highway where, you know, and that's where the black people generally live. But you had the white people generally lived down on the bottom of the hill and into town um, where you, well, we had another family of blacks at the bottom of the hill, but then the rest of town was all white. Um, but growing up, uh, you know, and being a black man, you had to be a little bit more cautious growing up. You had to be aware of your surroundings at all times. Um, you know, and in the South, you know, things can go bad, you know, really quickly. And that's what, you know, I grew up learning. Um, and even to this day, a lot of that stuff still sticks with you. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot more people that's open as you get older. Uh, because like I told, you know, my daughter, as she gets older as well, uh, as you become more successful, then you have, you know, the white people saying, well, you're part white. Then you have the black people saying, well, you're part black. Now everybody wanted, wants to own part of you as well. So, you know, so you have that dynamic that goes with it as well. But that comes in time and learning how to navigate that in this world, uh, in this community as well, being biracial. Rick, is it hard for you or was it hard growing up? Growing up for me, I grew up in uh, an area called Joliet, Illinois, and uh, which was predominantly a black area. We grew up on the east side of town. The west side was considered your more white area. And my mom was a prominent business lady in town. So me and my siblings, we went to Catholic school, but we lived in an all black neighborhood, black and Hispanic neighborhood. So we went to all white Catholic school. So I kind of got it from both sides, going to a Catholic school, all white and living in a predominantly black neighborhood. And me and my siblings, we all speak like I talk right now, which growing up, kids would tell me I sound like I'm white, you know, and I would have to explain to them what is that you know uh, so it was it was it was not difficult i learned as i grew up my parents talked to me and educated me on different things and then now today um really don't you know it's it's based on people will judge you based on what you look like what you drive what you possess and it comes from both sides okay okay so for tyler um you know, it's 2020. Are you seeing any form of racism or discrimination? Um, and Tyler, how old are you? Um, I'll be turning 20 in July. And Thank so I'm, I'm evidently still growing up. But, um, <laughs> I <think we> all are. <laughs> but yeah, but um, yeah, I have seen discrimination and like racism, even just like, I guess like different treatment from myself and then like white friends that I've had or just like how, like I've go over to like a black friend's house and how a family will kind of take me in, but then a white family's house, it could be a little bit weird at times. And then also even like within high school, my school is actually on the news for like huge racial division and stuff like that. And so um, I've experienced this a lot. I think the weirdest experience was in high school. 
um, there was this kid who had put out a bunch of like racist tweets on Twitter. And so people had confronted him on it. And so it started this huge like black and white controversy at my school. And then one morning that kind of like sent Channel 2 News to our school was one of the kids like had this huge rebel flag on the back of their pickup truck and drove it through the entire like school parking lot in the morning. And that caused like a huge like uproar. And I've also just experienced like um, being stopped by the police and being given like an excessively hard time, even though I wasn't really doing much of anything or them just being, or, or like me noticing how around my white friends they'll be a little more calm, but then to me, they want to be a little more hostile or ask me like extra questions that don't really pertain to like what's going on in the situation at all. But it's kind of all that I've gone through as like being a 19 year old. And Julian, do you see discrimination um, on a daily basis? And can you give us some examples if that's the case? Um, not completely on a daily basis, but yes, you do. You know, you still see it. I mean, we're, we're in Roswell, we're in North Fulton, you know, Cobb, uh, Cherokee County. It's still predominantly white, right? So, um, still growing up here, I mean, living here now, we, we still run into those situations. Um, I, I remember if you talk about one story, which was was crazy, and it was when um, the, the current guy in the White House was uh, elected. Um, we were here, we went to uh, the store, it was, it was Walmart, and, and right there in the middle of the parking lot, they had, a, uh, it was a huge KKK gathering. They had the flags flying and everything. And, and I was like, mm -hmm. I was blown away because um, I hadn't seen it that blatant in a, in a while. And, and, you know, knowing where we, you know, where we are and, and in the Woodstock areas, it's definitely, you know, we're, we're just, you know, getting into that black population, you know, up there. So, um, I think you see it. One of the things that's big is, is, and, and I think where we're facing a lot of trouble right now is that quiet racism, right? So it's not so much anymore of, okay, I'm just going to come out and, and just show you and do everything right, right to you. It's, it's that behind the scenes things, you know, is that, it's that, you know, looking at you, if you're in your business, in your car and how they look at you and, and really ask like, OK, is this really yours? And, and just little questions around it. Or if you say, yes, this is mine, they're like, oh, you know, you can see the look like, oh, really? And, you know, you know, distrust. And I've run into that before. I think that's the biggest part now. So it's more on the silent side than it is okay. kind of in your face. Tran, let me let me add to that a little bit. And when Julian brought up when you're in your cars or it was something like that, the first thing that people want to think, are you an athlete? Hmm. <laughs> you know, because they expect only an athlete can make money like that to drive a vehicle like that. You know, they don't understand that you can have a degree, be an attorney or an accountant or a doctor and drive a vehicle like that. The first thing they jump to is, oh, are you an athlete? You're an ex-athlete? Who'd you play for? You know. Okay. Um, so let's go to Black Lives Matter. Um, it's a statement that has been used for years, but yet it is so controversial um, because when you say Black Lives Matter, there are those who say all lives matter. Um, so explain that to us to where I feel now people are accepting of it more, they're understanding the message more. Um, Dr. James, can you explain that to us? Well, it's it's that's a, a very heavy question as well, um, because um, since its beginning, um, there have been different um, takes on what Black Lives Matter mean. Um, and I can only speak for me. Right. I can't speak for the movement. I can speak for me um, that any time that I hear um, Black Lives Matter, it's just a reminder that my life does matter, um, especially um, to other people. Right. Um, because um, Tyler brought up some things um, as as well as Robert. They're all bringing up all these conversations about they're in situations where we don't feel like we matter. Right. And so it's really a declaration for us 
to say, hey, I'm just going to let you know that my life matters. It's not saying no one else's does, right? But it says that my life matters and I want to, I want the world to know that um, I understand it. It's like that whole movement back in the day, um, I'm black and I'm proud, right? Or I am a man. It's all, all those movements. It's the, it's the same cadence, right? Um, but it just has a different effect now and that there are younger generations that are pulling towards it. And, you know, and I, I, I agree. And I, I want you all to kind of explain to us when you see all this that's going on, when you hear these comments. And I mean, honestly, social media is just blowing up with so many people shouting at one another just on their keyboard. Um, and I think people are having a hard time. What I think is listening. It's, it's just conveying that message. Um, and so when you're reading that and seeing all these comments and stuff, Robert, how does that make you feel? Which Robert? I'll, I'll tell you. Okay. I'll make you Robert. Okay, I forgot. I was saying Robert. Yes. No, uh, I think uh, activity on social media, but uh, I think since uh, the murder of Floyd, uh, people are much more open to listening. I mean, I, I really think this is a a watershed moment uh, because it has, and people want to listen. I mean, we've had dozens of other uh, black people, men and women that have been murdered at the hands of the police, but it hasn't galvanized the country. It hasn't had uh, white people wanting to listen. And I can't tell you, I've had uh, several people, whether it's clients or friends, uh, talk to me and, and we've had exchanges and as, as, as I said, groundbreaking exchanges that we never had before, where they express sympathy or will support, I shouldn't say sympathy, but support, and also uh, just ask questions. Like they asked me, like, am, am I afraid if I get pulled over by a cop? Uh, and they want to know what it's like. So I think for the first time, really, in my life, we have people that are uh, seeking understanding. That's what I've said. The biggest thing uh, to come from this is and to, to start of some positive change is seeking that understanding and things like this uh, certainly, you know, go toward that end. You know, and I, I do want to, I, you know, I'm, I'm so appreciative that um, everyone is being very respectful in this conversation and being very open and transparent because I, I feel that um, like what you were saying is people do want to learn right now and they do want to hear. And this is not about, this race against another race, or it's not again like blacks against cops and blacks against white or whatever. I feel like it's, you know, I feel like it's us against racism. Um, mm -hmm. So when you when you were talking about that, I think it is very interesting that people are more willing to speak up. Patrick, why is it? What is different this time? Um, and how have you been approached through this? Yeah. Well, I think it's different now, uh, one, because of social media it is a big key factor on getting the word out. Uh, people are starting to see it and notice it. You know, I believe it, a lot of people coined what Will Smith said is that, you know, uh, racism is not necessarily getting worse. It's just being filmed. Uh, and it's always been going on. But now with social media, uh, people are starting to see it and how more prevalent it really is. Uh, and now younger people are starting to get engaged and in getting involved with what's going on uh, in this movement. They're seeing it and witnessing it in their, in their time, not going back in the history books and looking at the 60s and the 50s and everything that uh, you know our ancestors did before that. Uh, they're looking at real time and this is what's going on and they have a voice. And they, they, they've witnessed a lot of murders uh, on, you know, brutality and police brutality, police uh, things going on. And it's not necessarily that, that the policemen are only ones that's killing people. I mean, there's a lot of crime out there that we have to acknowledge. But I think the biggest thing right now is social media. People are seeing it. People are getting involved, getting engaged, and they have a voice now. And this is their time to speak up about it. Uh, and they're not holding any punches. You right. know, when we talk about uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, when, whenever you first hear that term, it's like, OK, well, that's that's so uh, just one sided. You know, my life matters as well as a white person and my life matters as well as well as an Asian. Well, that is true. That's true. But that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about the situation that is uh, plaguing the black community. 
Um, mm. And so I'm, I'm in agreement. Everybody's life matters. You know, it does. You know, but at this point in time, black lives is going through a lot of problems and being killed and a lot of murders that's happening right now. We have to acknowledge that. And, you know, my sign that I, I was showing said, you know, all lives can't matter until black lives matter. So, so we want to be inclusive with all mm -hmm. lives matter. Then you know what? Let's get there. But first, let's acknowledge that Black lives matter as well. And I will just say, you know, in this community, I've seen a lot uh, of signs, and I've seen a lot of signs in the hands of white people that are acknowledging and addressing now that Black lives do matter, and they're not afraid to tell us and say, "Hey, we're we standing with you. We understand that your life matters to us, and we're going to make a statement now." And that just means so much to see that. Uh, in this community uh, right now rallying around us. Julian, um, so for you, are you seeing a lot of friends contacting you now and asking how you're doing and how you're feeling? I feel like that, I'm hearing that more from my black friends. And, and I feel like if we want to, I feel like if we don't reach out, you know, like this is such a big moment. Um, so are you seeing that? Are you seeing more support this time uh, yes, I, I definitely am. I, I, I definitely believe that uh, it's, it's I, I say it all the time, something's different about this one. Something is different. It's not the first, it's not the, the but something is different. And I think it's the fact that it was just in your face. It, you can't get that image out of your, out of your head. It's in your face. So there is something different. And it's funny that you bring that up because, um, and just today, I noticed that some of my high school friends started a group of, of a conversation. You know, let's just start in a conversation. That's what they call the group. Um, so it's all about high school, our, my high school classmates and everything who are talking about this and stuff that's going on. And one of the first questions I saw was one of my, uh, my white classmates who asked, he said, you know, he said, have, did I ever, you know, were, did we ever have that at our high school? We went to Freeport High School in New York. He was like, did we ever have that in high school? He said, because for him, he didn't remember seeing that. He was like, I, I don't remember that, but am I looking through the world in rose colored glasses? And and it was a it was an interesting question. So I'm reading the responses. I didn't get it to respond just yet, but um, you heard conversation um, um, answers like not really and it's and it was somewhat kind of true that our um our high school was somewhat a little different it's not like it wasn't there but the, the friends and the people who were close by you never really saw that much of it for such a diverse uh community so but you know things like that's going on where people are coming out and you know saying that they you know that i i'm on your side and and i and i have this and and, um, you know, the what can we do, things like that. Um, I do want to touch on one thing, and, and Patrick said perfectly, um, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, it's not that we said, you know, against all lives, it's, it's part of all lives, right? So I saw something one day and it was a perfect um, comment for it. It said, it said, if the phrase Black Lives Matter bothers you, because you believe that all lives matter, but you want to push forward that blue lives matter, which is not really a, you know, a life is not a, a being, then the common problem or the common, the wrong color is black, right? So if black lives bother you because you like all lives matter and blue lives matter, then that problem is black. And there goes your issue right there. You know, so everybody who's running like, I'm not this because all lives matter. Well, black lives are part of all lives. So if you have a problem with that, it's not we, I don't think anybody in this movement or anything. And he said this has said that it's only black lives. It's, if that's not the phrase. It's not only black lives matter. It's just black lives, you know, because of the of, of what we're seeing happen happening to us at this time. And, and that's, I think that's where we are. Yes, and Tyler, so for you, you had shared with me that um, you've had a lot of friends reach out to you as well. Um, will you share that with us? Yeah, um, yeah, I've had a lot of friends like reach out and just like 
say I'm here to support you. Like I hear you, I see you, I love you. And that's been just like very encouraging to me because I know that they do like love me and they see me and stuff like that as being a black man. But at the same time, it's just in this time, it's like comforting because I can oftentimes feel like um, invisible a lot of times. And oftentimes I think being black, you kind of want to stay under the radar just because like, I'm just trying to get by without getting having any trouble being caused or anything like that. And so with this moment, there is a huge spotlight on us black men because with the different events going on, we've seen to be the common target. And so with having friends like saying encouragement and saying those nice things to me, it's made me feel good. And it's made me feel like, okay, granted, it's not every white person that's calling my phone and being like, hey, I'm here and I support you. But I know that at least the small chunk of ones that are in my personal world, they're looking at me and they're like, I see you, I hear you, I'm here for you. If you need anything whatsoever, um, let me know. And most of this is like, I tell them, continue doing what you're doing and doing it to other people, not just me. And also they just come from like education and kind of like, well, what is it like? Because they don't know what it's like. They never, they never experienced any of it. And so it's, it's been just nice to just be able to educate and let all of my white friends know, like, here's what it's like being black in America right now. And here's what it's like to kind of live in my shoes. And so this has been a great encouragement. And I think it's been encouraging getting encouragement, but it's also been encouraging being able to like bestow knowledge upon my white friends just so I don't, we have a bunch of ignorant people walking around. And so that's just helps me feel better. Dr. James, um, so I know I have, and I sometimes I feel this way too. I want to say something and I'm overthinking it, you know, when I put it out there, does it sound like it's enough? Um, if I say it the wrong way, will I be criticized? And, you know, if I use the wrong words, what can I do? But if I don't say something, then I'm racist and I'm not supporting my friends. And I know that there are a lot of people who are out there feeling the same way. Do you get tired of trying to educate us? I mean, any of you? Um, so, Rob, Dr. James, I'm going to start with you. Um, no, ne I never get tired educating. Um, but the, the thing for me, I'd rather you just be honest with me so we can have a conversation. Let's have a dialogue. Don't, don't try to, like you said, don't try to rehearse it because it won't work. I will call you out on it. Right. Um, but just be, be authentic. And if we have a relationship, we're, we can have this conversation together. So yes, I, I don't have a problem explaining. I don't have to have a problem giving some history and some facts behind movements, um, I'm, I'm really open to that, right? Um, but, but for me, I think, for me, I'm past this moment right now, right? I'm ready for the what's next. Okay. What's next? What what do we have to do? Let's get past this talk moment, right? And let's move into, we now have a job to do so change can happen in the land. So uh, we're gonna definitely get to that. I'd love to hear about the what's next. But before that, uh, Rick, Let's, if you can elaborate more on that question as well in helping friends um, support you in a positive, meaningful way. Help us out here. Well, uh, earlier today, a high school friend actually sent me a message uh, via Facebook. I hadn't talked to this guy probably in probably 20 years. And uh, he sent me a message saying, hey, Rick, hope things are going well. I just wanted to reach out. And he wanted me to watch this video and give him some feedback on the video. And he said, also, by the way, I want to ask you, do you feel that there was racism, racism at our high school? And uh, there was some racism. I can't remember anybody ever calling me out of my name, but there was some racism. Uh, and I told him, let me think about it and I'll get back to him. Uh, and even today, this the last couple of weeks, you know, at the facility, you know, had a few members come up and talk to us about different questions and ask, what can they do? And, 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 and me and Julian, we had the most touching moment. Was that on Friday, Julian? Where right. a kid that's been training with Julian for how long, Julian? Uh, Good three years now. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. And now he, he just completed his first year of college. He came in and he was like, hey, Rick, when you and Julian get a couple minutes, can I talk to you? And we go into the office and me and Julian's like, what's, you know, we're thinking, you know, something else. And he was so sincere from his heart. Here it is, this 19 year old kid. And telling us that he looks up to us, he respects us. And basically, what can he do? And my answer to him was, I can see your heart. And if you can relay that message and carry it on like that, nobody will ever think anything less of you. And and, and there's another person who comes in and she's like one of the sweetest ladies I know. And she was in tears. And she's like, it's hard for her. She has friends from all walks of life and it's hard for her to know how to ask this question. And if you ask a question that is coming from your heart, the person you're asking will accept it from your heart. You know, Patrick, yeah. let's address the process. Um, we've had a lot more, obviously. I saw this powerful video today that someone had put together and there are clips from the protests from across the country. Um, just about every state has had some kind of a march or protest, and then even other countries as well. I saw a story about Amish people holding a protest, you know, and, um, and I'm like, they never come out. So then, and I'm Vietnamese, and in Los Angeles, there's a Vietnamese group that just had a fundraiser um, for Black Lives Matter. So, uh, Patrick, when we, we see these protests, these marches, the, um, these displays of solidarity, clearly working, but there's that other side. And so there are people who say, okay, that's just bringing out all the looters and the people burning down buildings and, and all the, you know, the criminal acts. Um, can we address that, Patrick? Well, I think when you look at the, the demonstrations, of course, we have to kind of get to the root of the issue of why we're actually protesting um, and why are we actually out there? Uh, and, and a lot of it, yes, there's a lot of de what, you know detractors that's trying to steer you away from what it was initially started off as, as a peaceful protest. 95 to 99 percent of the people that's out there protesting, uh, marching, uh, they're doing it the right way. Uh, and it's good to see that there is solidarity out there, but there's always going to be those different type of groups that's going to get out there and try to make it about them that has their own agenda. Uh, and, and I've heard it before, as far as the, the root of the problem is always getting buried. You know, that root is, is deep down in there and it gets buried uh, and we just trample all over it instead of going and continue to see what the root of the issue is. You know, and, and when we look back at, you know, police brutality in this country, we look at equality, we look at um, everywhere we've been over the last 400 years to now, um, you know, all that plays a part into the system. And you can't say, and a lot of people try to say there's, you know, there's not systematic racism or it's not a systematic oppression and things like that. But, you know, there was a system that was put in place hundreds and hundreds of years ago that is still in place until today. And we're still living off of those uh, ramifications and repercussions of what was put in place. You know, uh, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, black people couldn't go to certain colleges. It wasn't that long ago that they couldn't vote. It wasn't, there's a lot of people that are still alive today that was against that. And so uh, our ancestors, you know, there's a lot of, you know, societal that built on our ancestors' backs, per se. We didn't get a chance to jump on their back and keep pushing ourselves up. You know, we basically had to kind of do it on our own at this point moving forward. Um, so we can't go back. But the thing is, is that we have to understand why we're doing it, what we're doing. Don't get this distracted by, you know, the glitter of this, the riots, you know, and, you know, even Martin Luther King, we always try to go back to Martin Luther King. Everybody wants to go back to Martin Luther King, you know, nonviolence protest, this and that. You know, and even, you know, Martin Luther King said, yeah, he didn't like the nonviolent, the, the rioting of the protests. But he also stated that riots and violence is the voice of the unheard. And that's what we're finding with today's youth. That they just don't feel heard. And so they can resort to different things when they're not being heard and their voices aren't coming out and people aren't doing anything about it. Uh, and it hasn't been done for the, the time that they've been alive. And that's what we have to look at now is I can look back and say, yeah, we marched, we chanted, we protested and things got done nonviolently. Today's youth, 
they can't look at themselves and look at other youth and say, okay, well, this is what happened. This was the outcome. No, we've been telling y'all, you know, and they look at Kaepernick and Kaepernick did not violently. He was sitting there and he was telling y'all, don't let it come to this. And now it has come to this. Uh, and, and I don't condone the violence. I don't condone the riots. We need to continue to look at the main issue here uh, and, and stick to it and don't get distracted from everything that's going on around it. Robert Haddix, if we don't protest, if we don't march, we don't care? Um. No, I, I I wouldn't go I wouldn't go to that that extreme. Um, you know, it is always a, a bonus if you are active in your protest rather than silent. Uh, and like I said, when you asked me what was my one word in terms of uh, my feeling, being encouraged, uh, being out in downtown Roswell Friday and just seeing a group of young kids, predominantly white kids march down Alpharetta Street, I mean, that that to me was very moving and important. And uh, as I said on Facebook, I mean, I do think that the youth will lead us. And the youth, uh, I was having a discussion with a client today, most people are gonna be much more accepting, uh, and I'm talking uh, majority, uh, they're gonna be more accepting racially than their parents, okay? So uh, these kids, yeah, they don't see as as much racism as their grandparents. They're not going to have some of those biases that their grandparents had. Um, but again, to get back to your question, no, I, I wouldn't say that somebody is not. Uh, I, I wouldn't criticize them if they didn't. I would I would hope that they did, but I wouldn't hold it against them if. Oh, we just lost him. Okay, Julian, you're going to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so look, I wouldn't hold it against them. If, there you go. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hold it against them if they didn't come out because because you still don't know somebody's heart. And and really and truly, um, just because some of these people are out there, we still don't know fully where they are. It could be the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So. So it's good. It's great to see people out there and doing everything and, and going. Yes, it is encouraging, but you still want to sit back and say, okay, that 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 question, that um, statement that Patrick made a little earlier. I mean, oh no, Doctor Doctor Robert said it was, what's next? Okay, so we've all done this and we we've, we've gotten to this part and where everybody's upset, frustrated, and ready to push forward. Well, what's it going to look like in in two weeks? What's it going to look like in a month, right? Is it still going to be this fire or, or is everybody just going to settle back into what life used to be? You know, um, but as I said before, this one feels different. Yes. I don't know, but this one feels different. I, I believe that we can see something else outside of this. And I'm hoping that all, you know, black, white, Hispanic, um, Indian, as you said, there's so many different people coming together on this right now um, that, I hope that we do see something that moves on um, from from where we are right now. So it sounds like we're just itching to get to like the what's next. <laughs> I'm ready to. Okay, we're gonna. But before we do, can I just someone tell me what can we do for the now? So we're talking about the marches. We're talking about the walks. We're talking, Dr. James. What can we do now to show support um, in a positive and meaningful way? Because I feel like there, there's also that support out there that's just a lot of shouting and a lot of name, you know, and this is from all sides. I'm not, we're not criticizing any one group, but I feel like there are people who want to be supportive and yet sometimes their words are probably more hurtful and it's even more divisive. So Dr. James, can you just like tell us? Um, the the best way right now for support is less talking, more listening, mm. right? Um, since we know that it's the voice of the unheard, just hear them, listen to their stories, listen to their pain, listen to how they're, they're feeling, have more conversations like this, um, just to make sure that, and let them know that you hear them. Don't respond. The moment you respond, that creates something else, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So just you, you, I think that this season that we just need to listen on both sides, right? Yeah. Just to hear the, the pain and what's going on in our community. Yes. 
Um, Julian, do you have something to add to that? No, he, I mean, he, he said exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly what it is. Yeah. Just listen. Yeah. Oh. So, and, and Tran, um, just kind of piggyback, I think, like Dr. James said, uh, Pasta, um, <laughs> is that uh, right now it's listening and, and having conversation and being open and transparent uh, and listening to where they're coming from. You know, and that's kind of where we need to be at this point right now. Uh, you know, I've gotten phone calls from people I haven't talked to in years uh, that just want to talk and just want to ask some questions uh, and, and get my viewpoint on different things. Uh, but also just just listening. I mean, you know, just from uh, my daughter uh, who has a voice and just wants to get her voice out there. You know, and, and you know, even with this COVID-19 thing, it's, it's very risky. Uh, with a lot of the protests and the marchings and things that's going on. And we have to take all that into consideration. And there's a lot of people that's unemployed, they're hurting right now, and they just need an outlet to say something, uh, to be part of it, to get out uh, and address what's going on. Um, but I think the biggest thing is to give them that outlet, let them say what they need to say, ask the questions, be real, be transparent, uh, do what we're doing right now, uh, and let the voices be heard, because we don't want to continue to let our youth be silent and unheard, uh, because that's when trouble begins. And we need to utilize our experiences and our knowledge to educate them on, on how to go about things the right way and make sure their voices are heard and that they have an outcome uh, and a goal to achieve once we get to that point of what's next. I know you're so, you're trying to tell me. But, uh, <laughs> I just have, I just. I'm looking at pastor. <laughs> He's like, I'll take over, Pastor. Um, but you know what, though, Patrick, um, you're so right. And now I've lost my train of thought because you're. I'm thinking next. Go on to the next thing. Um, but what I what I appreciate, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. But what I appreciate is when we talk, and when we listen, and when we want to share, kind of have it. We all. But if you would also you know, allow us that grace as well. Because sometimes people say stuff and it's not meant to be racist or hateful or, um, you know, I think we just, people just have questions. And and this is a time to educate, not criticize, not put down, not push away because that further the divide. But again, I'm preaching to the choir on that. So I appreciate that. All right, next. Tyler, I'm going to start with you because you are the next. I know Dr. James is like, I'm, I'm on the call. Um, <laughs> so, Tyler, um, you're you're the next generation. We're going to start with you. What do you think is next, and what do we need to do next that will truly impact and make a difference? Um, I know. Speaking for like my generation, I know. I'm not one of them, but I know in, in my generation, there are a lot of people who just don't really care about voting. They're just like, if I can't do anything, yada, yada, yada. That's why a lot of them are out here doing the rides and doing all stuff like that because they think that's what's going to make change happen. But really, it's like using the ability that our ancestors did not have within voting is what's going to change because even though, yes, these problems have superseded a lot of different presidents, when Obama, Trump, all these different presidents, these problems have still existed within it. But still, if we can vote in and get in the right people that can change and enforce new rules, new ways of things, and enforce a new way of life and really inspire everyone else to live that life as well, then that's a change that can be truly effective to where I, as a black man, can go like, I don't have to give my child one day the talk if Hey, son, if the cop stops you, hands on top of the dash, ask them if you can grab stuff. And just, I want to have that if we vote in the right people that will make a change happen. And that's one of the biggest things is voting. And also, I think another big thing we all can do, like, personally and internally, is just looking at other people with, like, more love. Because the issue with, like, right now is there's a lot of lack of love. And the lack of love is coming in people like don't feel misunderstood people don't feel heard that's the both people like people can feel loved by being heard people who do not feel heard don't feel loved people who don't feel seen people can 
feel loved through being seen. And so there are these different ways of people not feeling loved. That's why they're acting out. I think because I've worked in child care a lot. I've noticed with children, the ones who don't act up are the ones who are loved and listened to. Yeah. And the ones who do act up are the ones that don't get much attention. They aren't really listened to that much. Those are the ones that are going out, hitting kids with toys, stealing graham crackers, and just doing a bunch of craziness. But the ones who are listened to, they're the ones that if you tell them, hey, stop, calm down, they'll be like, oh, okay. And so that's the same thing now, but just with adults. Rather than stealing graham crackers and causing havoc on a playground, people are out here throwing, like, flipping cars and robbing stores. It's because we're adults now. And so the biggest thing is just loving people, hearing them, and understanding them. And that all just, like, I think love is really going to fix this completely. And my generation can really just drive home love. All this can be fixed to where this won't even be a problem, like, 70 years in the future to where it, like the future like three generations from now this won't even be something that has to be talked about because it just does not exist whatsoever so that's kind of like my thing for what my generation can do for the next movement to make this better and make this a better world and there's your mom that's i'll mention right now that's my baby you know <laughs> speaking of love um I think we're in good hands if this is the future of you know, our generation. Um, yes. Tyler, I'm going to do the hashtag Tyler for president, okay? There you go. There you go, Tyler. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you for president. So, yeah, yeah. Sure. Now it's time to listen to your elders um, about the, uh, the next. Dr. James. Oh, please. no. I, I, I could listen to Tyler. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Because he brought those good points, because for us, um, it's it's really the only way next is the us to really understand um, loving one another, which is really, really important um, as you love yourself. Right. Um, mm -hmm. For the community of faith aspect. But for me, it's about making sure we have the people in the right positions, um, in right places, uh, making sure that we have people who are willing to allow others to the table. Right. Um, and that's that's the issue we're seeing in a lot of our communities. We have people at the table who are trying to speak for us, but they're not us. Um, and so those are some drastic changes, I guess, that need to take place as it relates to what's next. And then for me is empowering new leaders like Tyler. Right. To give them all the tools that they need so that they can run and not have to worry. Right. We provide all the support that they need to let their vision go forward. Uh, and that's 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 all I'll share. Well, that was worth the wait, Dr. James. <laughs> <laughs> um, so does anyone else want to add? We're going to start wrapping up. Um, so does anyone else want to add anything or contribute to what's next? Yeah. Well, I think. Uh, 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 yes, voting, voting is pivotal. Um, but again, we, we've had this problem uh, for years, regardless of who's in office. So I do think we need to look beyond that and, and just take more more action. Um, and also, even though we kind of moved from the talking, one point that I wanted to uh, make was that we need to talk with people who don't look like us, don't don't think like us. Uh, because too many people stay in their own little bubble and uh, it's, it's easy to uh, hold those views that they may be antiquated, they may, may be racist, whatever they may be, but it's easy to hold those views when you surround yourself with people who look and think like you. So again, uh, multiculturalism and just getting different points of view uh, respectfully, and I think that uh, will help advance the cause. I think, um, uh, Tran, just to uh, piggyback on that a little bit, I saw a comment that popped through as far as uh, the question of what the talk is. Um, right. I know Tyler mentioned that as well. Uh, and, and I think forums like this and having conversations in, in the personal uh, is is major. And I want Tyler to kind of say, you know, because even with me growing up, uh, some of the things as far as that talk is, you know, when you're out and you're driving, you know, mm -hmm. you're looking straight ahead. You know, if, if you get pulled over where I'm from, the talk was if you get pulled over, a cop comes behind you, you turn on your flashers to yeah. let them know that you see them. And you drive to the uh, most well-lit, 
in a populated place. Very slowly, yeah. you slow down, put your flashers on. You don't pull over at the side of the road. No. You don't do that in the pitch black. You don't do that with nobody around. You pull. You go straight to a gas station. You drive to the police station itself, and you get and you pull over there. You don't do that on a on a back road. Um, you know things like that. And those kind of conversations. And when you ask mm-hmm. for your license registration, your hands are on the wheel. If you can get to it before they come close to the car, you do it quickly. You have it close by you, so you don't have to reach in your glove compartment. You already have it ready to go, and you yeah. ask questions before you move. I mean, mm-hmm. things like that. Those are the type of talks that we have to have right. yes. growing up. And those are the, still the same talks same that talk. we same have to have right. with our kids today. And, yeah. and, and we shouldn't have to, but that's what we do. And I know uh, somebody asked Tyler about his talk. So I don't want to go back, but I think it's important that people understand that we're not just making this stuff. This is generational. Uh, this yeah. is people before me, before me, before them. And now even Tyler even his generation still having that talk. Uh, can you just mention something about that, Tyler? Yeah. Um, so the talk that like my father gave me was just a lot of what you said. Um, a new thing definitely was I've never heard before was like pulling into a very well lit populated place because they can't, they won't do as much if there's people watching and around, which is a very, very excellent idea you hit on. But yeah, so talk is mostly like get pulled over. And typically for me, like I said, if I have enough time, I get my wallet and my phone. I put it on my dash and wallet with my hands. So if you have to ask for anything, I don't have to reach for it. And even with so, like, I know I was, I got pulled over on like a busy interstate. And so there was not any place to go for me to go turn off to. But he had asked for those things. And even though, yes, they were right next to my hands on top of the dash, I still said, officer, is it okay if I go get my license out of my wallet? Then he said, yeah, go ahead, get it. So I got it. I give it to you. Then I gave it to him then he asked for some other questions and so just being as respectful as possible and i know a lot of times police can't come in to approaching us with like hostility or they can be a little more aggressive than usual and one thing my other dad taught me is to like just be calm and to like de-escalate the situation like if he's coming at you all crazy don't answer him back and be like well why are you answering that why is your attitude all hot like they're like calm the situation down because typically if you're calm, they'll be calm, and everything will just go smoothly. Be respectful, and also move slowly. Like I know, like if I if I drop something, I'm not gonna get it. I'm a, I'm gonna get it once I can pull over and get something else because it's just not the smart thing to do. And so, yeah, talking about the end, and also I think, not, and not even just within like cars because cars one of the big ones being pulled over, but even just like being out in public, being very aware of what you're doing how you're doing it and what you're looking like as you're doing it. Because I know there are a lot of things that I can do that if I don't do the most, if I, if, if I don't do it cautiously, I can get looked at and be like, well, what was that black kid doing? But someone else can be like, oh, he's just doing whatever. But since I'm black, they can look and be like, well, it's kind of suspicious what's going on. And so really being cautious of the image I'm putting out when I'm in public, especially if I'm in an area where I'm not surrounded by everyone that looks like me. If I'm surrounded by everyone that looks like me, I'm not really going to worry about that too much because I'm like, I'm blending in. I'm sticking out with a sore thumb. I'm going to make sure that I'm looking as presentable as possible so I'm not looked at in a certain way where a police will be called on me or someone will be like, there's a, a suspicious kid coming, like, I'm going to need some help or whatever. And so just being as smart as possible and even though it's can be unfair and unfortunate, always knowing that, okay, yes, I am black. I can't just live my life normally like how everybody else can. And so I gotta be smarter and I gotta move a lot wiser because my life depends on it. And Rick, um, you know, this is also something that um, there are a lot of parents out there who are talking to their children um, about what's going on. You know, you know, and you know, I have two children. We we've had ongoing conversations with them on how they participate in this, and I'm not sure if someone is typing on a keyboard. Um, so, t- will you talk to us about how we talk to our children about what's going on and how they can make an impact? Well, my son Miles is 22, and I had a conversation with him yesterday and the day before and also today 
And he kind of opened my eyes to a lot of things. You know, we were talking and I brought up some points and he brought up some points and he explained this point and I apologize to him today because I saw in the news what his age group is doing as far as the police department, you know, in different states. Uh, and I apologize to him. I said, I see why you're thinking like that because that's what your age group is thinking. And I also told him that uh, he has to realize that, like I said, Miles is 22, good kid, has dreadlocks. And I hate that he has dreadlocks. Dr. Robert, you have dreadlocks, but <laughs> there's a reason that I don't like him having dreadlocks because he's, he's targeted because of that. And, you know, I have to give him to go back to the speech. When Miles got his license, I told him, you know, everything that we just talked about on here. But one thing that I added was your job is to be respectful to that police officer, whether he's being disrespectful of you or not. If he's going to put you in handcuffs, allow him to put you in handcuffs. My job, your job is to go to jail. My job is to get you out of jail safely. Your job is to get there, get there safely. Let me worry about that. So that's what I explained to my son. And just hearing the different points of him telling me what's going on. And one question that he asked me was, Dad, what are you doing? And I had to sit back and say, wow, what am I doing? Uh, if it, it, I guess I'll go into detail about this conversation a little bit. And I think I, I did talk to you earlier about this trend. We talked about this several times and you know, it's, it's kind of of a touchy conversation when you talk about us as a race, we have to learn to love ourselves before we can love others and expect others to love us. Yeah. Right? We have to learn how to treat our race within our race before we expect other races to treat us the same. And Miles said to me, well, dad, what are you doing back where you grew up? Are you going back to your community? Are you doing anything? And I had to sit back and think and say, you're exactly right. And so over the last few days, I'm thinking, what can I do to help a young kid that's in a situation that he doesn't know any better? You know, in order for a kid's mind to change, he has to explore, whether it's the parents taking him on vacation or taking him to different places, take him outside the community. You know, so that's how I'm questioning myself. What am I going to do next to help the next generation? So it does seem like you all have some work to do with growth um, and building relationships and building love and showing solidarity. So um, we are about to hit the one hour mark. Yeah. And um, so clearly this is a conversation that needs to be heard and need to continue. So I'm hoping that this is not the end for all of us, whether it's in a public forum like this or in face to face or some, you know, tweeting with your friends. Um, but I want to um, thank you all for being here. And I want to let our viewers know that there was no memo. We just all happened to wear blue <laughs> <laughs> as each person popped up. Uh, blue is the color. And so I think it's also very fitting, right? Um, even though it wasn't planned, I feel that's very fitting that we, we're all really in this together. It's, it's a statement that we're tired. Solidarity. Yes. So blue is the color of solidarity. Um, so I want to end with, um, first of all, the reason why I didn't do a bio at, at the beginning was because I wanted us all to look at one another without any preconceived notions and any, oh, because, oh, you're, you know, you're a pastor, you own a business, you're, um, you know, you work in the corporate world, you're a trainer, you're a student. I don't want, I didn't want people to look at this as um, your voices through what you do, because it's not that, right? Um, it's not what you do, it's not what you wear. Uh, so that's the reason why I didn't do the bios, but I'm, I respect all of you and I'm super impressive, impressed with your bios. So I would like to end with going around the room and 
I want to ask, are you hopeful, Julian? Yes, I, I am very hopeful. I am very, very hopeful. A um, couple of reasons. One, I stated earlier, this seems different. Um, just what happened, how horrible it is. You can't say that it was good just to see that happen, but I believe that some good has come out of it. And just the just the determination and and drive that you see. And then also just like Tyler, I mean, and, and I don't think anybody else needed to answer the what's next part of that uh, question because Tyler hit it on the <laughs> nose. I mean, that was spot on for what he said. And, and that's where my hope is. Um, I went to a protest yesterday that was led by uh, people Tyler's age and it was outstanding. They did a great job. And, you know, I just went to talk to them and express the same thing. They did a great job. They said the, the in, in Buckhead, it was one of the largest ones that they had down going to the governor's office was organized by a 19 year old as well. That's hope. That's hope right there. Yeah. Dr. James. Um, I agree with Julian. Um, I'm very hopeful this season. I'm hopeful for Tyler's generation right? Um, that they're going to help bring this change, right? Um, for us, um, for our future, um, because they're, they're going to be the ones that lead it for us. That's, that's how it's happened in the past. The, the younger generations have led the movements and I, and I'm grateful for Tala's passion, right? Um, uh, to just, to just be a part of this conversation. So yes, I'm hopeful. Tyler, clearly you're hopeful because you're, you're, you're caring for us. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm extremely hopeful and not just for the fact that um, my generation is going to be the ones going to be taking over this and we've done a decent enough job, in my opinion, to start this. But I'm also hopeful because we have um, men and women like y'all who are going to be that we can look up to and look back to to receive history, to receive wisdom from. And so our us ourselves are going to be able to take this on and then we have great people to fall back on when we actually do need the help so i'm very hopeful patrick you know i, I started this as, as being hopeful and i am just even more hopeful and grateful uh for this type of a forum for us to be able to just speak and, and let our voices be heard um you know yesterday just being out with my daughter uh, and, and having signs and the the support of everybody driving by, honking, waving, you know, cheering, clapping, you know, uh, stopping and giving us Gatorade, water, different things like that, and supporting us. And it wasn't just us as Black Lives Matter; it was other people acknowledging that Black Lives Matter. Uh, and it takes all of us. And this is unprecedented as far as when I look back at, at protests and marches and rallies, uh, I've only seen a lot of black folks and a few white folks. Uh, and now I'm seeing Asian, I'm seeing blacks, I'm seeing white. And sometimes in cases there's more white than they're black. And you know, to see some people holding up Black Lives Matter that is not black is, is just amazing. And like you're saying, it's a change, it's a new day. Uh, we're seeing this all over the world, uh, people protesting and carrying signs. And it's, it's, it's just hopeful that we're gonna get to where we need to be as a country and as a world. Uh, because that's what this movement is all about. And it's being more equal, more equal uh, than ever before. And I'm just hopeful that this is going to continue on. Uh, and let's just keep the conversations going. And, and my family, everybody that's out there watching as well, call me. Let's talk. You know, if you're not my family, send me an uh, inbox in my message here on Facebook. Let's talk. I want to talk. Uh, and I think that that's where it all uh, going to be. And what's next? Let's talk. Let's keep the conversations going and let's make real progress uh, at the root of the issue. Uh, and that is within us and our paradigms and our own thought processes. All right, Rick. I love it. I'm hopeful because I see change coming uh, and it, it, it softens my heart when I watch TV and I see these gatherings and it's not just like Patrick was saying, it's not just African-Americans. You have all races out there. And what really makes me feel great and see change coming is you see the youth and when you see kids that are like sixth grade, 10th grade college students, this is letting you know that 
in the past, parents would not have allowed their kids to go to something like this, Caucasian mm -hmm. parents. So when you see youth of a different race gathering all one as a unity for one cause, and that lets you know that their parents are not instilling in them racism. So that's why I see change coming. Can't say when it's coming, but that's a change right there. One step closer with the unity of all nationalities out there marching. All right, Robert. You have to work for us, Robert. Yeah, I'm. I'm hopeful. I mean, that was the word I used at the top. Uh, just based based on what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling, what I'm hearing uh, in my own circle uh, across the country. Just uh, as Julian has said, th this one is different. Uh, I think in part because it was just there and it was so uh, in, in your face that you you can't turn away from this one. And people now are are receptive to change. So people's mindset has been changed. And uh, as I've said, yeah, this this is a great opportunity uh, that we have to take take advantage of. Uh, it, it's all right there in front of us. Um, so yeah, that that's the positive. Uh, and I do say also just hearing Tyler speak, and I, I love hearing the kids speak. Uh, but I think we also have to think about like him saying, okay, he he still has to worry about how he presents and what he has to do. Uh, whereas a, a white kid may not have to think that, or even Rick saying, talking about yeah. Dr. Robert, well, I, I wish he didn't have dreads. Like dreads are not incriminating. Hey, they, are not <laughs> they, they are perceived. <laughs> but again, it's a, it's a whole other level that we have to get to. And we, right. we can't have this consciousness about what we are. And yeah, hopefully we get to that point where Again, it's, it's not a thought for us. We can we can be who we are and, and being mm -hmm. black in any aspect or in any realm that we do it in itself is not a crime. Yeah. And with that. Oh, hey, Trent, yeah. can I yeah. say one last thing? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, just, I just want to bring back to full reality. And when we talk about next steps. And I think the biggest thing that's got to happen right now is that those four police officers in, Min in Minnesota have to be convicted. Start right, if you go anything else, and that's something that's strange because that's out of our hands. We have nothing to do with that. But I pray to God that Minnesota gets this right because if mm -hmm. that does not happen, I don't know what's going to yeah. happen to this country. Ugly. That's the truth. that is the complete truth right there. What will happen to this country if they come off and say that somebody there is innocent and absolved of all charges? And that's my final point. No, a valid point. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate all of you. Um, some of you are friends. Some of you are new friends. Um, so I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you talking. I appreciate you sharing. And for everyone who is, oh, Julia, I think um, it looks like we have you for mayor. So we have a presidential candidate and a mayoral candidate. <laughs> 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 So that's what's next. I didn't realize this is going to be an announcement um, uh, for, for the next next campaign. Um, so with that, I say good night to all of you. I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone who took the time to tune in tonight for an hour long conversation that is so needed. Um, and I really just appreciate this and hopefully what's next is more peace, more solidarity, more love. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.